Uh, well, uh, I've been told that I have a problem keeping it short, so I'm going to avoid introductions. Um, anyway, so um, so the idea here is to um, uh, I've been thinking about um, ways of extending some views on stru epistemic structural realism. Um, so uh, one of the most important approaches here is um, in on the epistemic structural realism uh, views is by uh, Ioannis and he uh, he has been trying to extend to 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 fortify the, the epistemic structural realism project to uh, solve some issues and uh, uh, but there might I mean there there's there are some problems here that I'm going to mention that. Uh, maybe uh, I'm not so clear as to how the view uh, can handle them. So, uh, so an, an interesting, so an important thing about the, the epistemic structural realist view is that it's a view that uh, has been around for a while, but uh, one of the most important people who developed the view uh, in its early stages was Russell. And the, the, the Rossellian view has some uh, per peculiar characteristics which distinguish it from other views. So um, my thought was, well, maybe it's worthwhile to uh, go back to Russell again to see if there's anything there that, that can uh, help us address some of the issues that I'm worrying about. So, um, so the idea is going to be to try to see if there are any details in the, in the Rossellian uh, views which he explored in, uh, for example, in human knowledge, which is from 1948, which can help us uh, extend the ESR problem, uh, program. And then I have what basically amounts to a case study uh, involving space time. Um, but I'm not sure, like there are uh, many things that I'm not uh, really sure about. So this is basically a, a work in progress and I'm hoping to get some feedback here uh, on these ideas, but uh, if so, th this might go into one of my uh, disser PhD dissertations. So, um, all right. So, uh, so broadly speaking, the epistemic structural realism view um, is the view according to which uh, our scientific knowledge is restricted to the structural features of the, of the world. Uh, by structural features, we mean something like the logical mathematical features of uh, of um, uh the, the external world in a sense and uh, those are the features that are going to be captured in our scientific theories and our scientific models according to this view and i mean obviously you can contrast it broadly speaking with anti-realist views and with um uh other forms of uh, scientific realism and and other forms of structural realism so specifically uh the view is held by many for example by world to be a sort of uh, view which is in the middle of <coughs> Uh, anti-realism and scientific realism, but it's also supposed to be metaphysically a less radical view than uh, ontic structural realism, which is the view that uh, all there is is a structure. Informal, informally speaking, uh, there are many ways to formulate ontic structural realism. Many philosophers, many important philosophers, have tried to uh, characterize ontic structural realism in a way which is satisfactory and solves some of, of uh, the issues there. But I'm not going to be concerned with the with the ontic view, with the ontic structural realism view. Uh, just to say that the contrast is that the epistemic structural realist is not denying that there might be uh, individuals. He's just uh, un unobservable individuals. He's just saying that of the unobservable part of reality, we only know its structure. And then here are some notions that uh, might be useful um, later on. So. Uh, basically, we, we can understand by a these are like set theoretic ways of defining uh, a structure, and some of these are used by uh, Ioannis in his work. And uh, they are inspired by uh, Russell's version of relational arithmetic. But of course, Russell didn't believe that there were sets, uh, but in any case, this is a, a, a formulation that you can give with contemporary set theory. So you have a concrete structure with, uh, which consists of um, sets of objects together with relations. And you can talk about isomorphisms between those. 
uh, so to relate to concrete structure, structures are isomorphic if um, there's a mapping, a bijective mapping between them that preserves the relations. And then you can talk about the class of all those things as an abstract stru structure. And uh, the idea is that uh, the sort of knowledge that we will have about uh, unobservables will be knowledge of abstr abstract structures. So, um, Now, there are two distinctions between structural realism. Uh, the downward view, which is focused on historical arguments, basically he, arguments from the history of science, and uh, the upward view, which is the view that I'm going, we are going to be concerned with right now. And the upward view, uh, basically, is the view that um, we might be able to get some uh, ground in structural realism via sensory perception. So. Uh, if you look at uh, our, our sensory perceptions and you have some further assumptions about the way in which they map into reality, then uh, those might be sufficient to give you some sort of uh, um, of, of anchor to the uh, external world. Um, now, here are three important, very important assumptions, assumptions of uh, what people called uh, the early versions of uh, structural realism. These are the uh, Helmholtz well principle, the mirror relations principle, which are basically different effects, different causes. Uh, there are ways of making that uh, that principle a bit more detailed, which I'm going to mention in a, in a while. And there's also the mirror relations principle, which is strictly stronger. And it says that relations between percepts correspond to relations between their non-perceptual causes in a manner which preserves their logical mathematical properties. So. Uh, basically, the idea is that if you have some sort of, if you have a set of percepts and you have some relations between them, those relations are going to have logical mathematical properties. So, for example, something like uh, reflexivity, reflexivity, symmetry, transitivity, those are the sorts of logical mathematical properties that we're thinking of. And the idea will be that if you have some of these assumptions, then maybe uh, if you have some perceptions, then they will map into a reality where uh, even if you are not completely, if you don't, even if you don't have acquaintance with what's going on with those unobservables, should these assumptions hold, then uh, you will know that they will have the same logical mathematical, the relations between the unobservables will have the same logical mathematical properties as the relation between your percepts. Um, now, you can go into more detail here, but so one, one heavy assumption that I must mention is that at least in the historically uh, important Rossellian view, some of the the distinction between observables and unobservables was not the typical distinction, like un uh, unobservables were basically everything that was outside the body. Uh, but this is not a sense data view, that's important to clarify, this is a view which is uh, after that. And, they, and Russell treated the view um, as a sort of naturalistic hypothesis, and the idea will be to think of the body as something which is receiving inputs and stimuli uh, all the time from the external world, and those inputs and stimuli are going to have, uh, which are the observables, are going to have um, um, an impact in the things that they were going to perceive, in, uh, to, to, to perceive, and then our perceptions are going to have these logical mathematical structures which are going to map to reality in, in some way. So the idea will be, in a sense, that you have this sort of bijective mapping between, uh, in ideal cases, between what's going on in perception and what's going on in reality. But of course, we have, I mean, there are some uh, clear questions that one might ask about what happens with microscopes or telescopes, etc. And in those cases, we might say that uh, uh, it's sufficient to have some sort of embedding, which is strictly weaker than a bijection, in order to secure some sort of, some sort of foothold. And we can incorporate these uh, extra instruments like microscopes or uh, telescopes as further um, structure uh, the level of the observables, right? Um, but here are three, uh, three questions which I think that the epistemic structural realist has to answer. Uh, so one of these is uh, how can we deal with incomplete and redundant information? So for example, um, how can we incorporate information about uh, regions where no one is where there's no one or uh, where no one has observed anything or uh, the future or the past. Uh, if, it's, if it's so based in, on perception in, in that way, then how can we do that? Uh, how can we make it more, pu more public? Um, also, um, 
how can I mean? Of course, the, like the, some of the of the logical mathematical machinery that we have given so far is very sparse. So how can you do so much work with so little machinery? Obviously, uh, obviously the epistemic structure of realist is not just committed to using these mappings, right? He's commit. He can use any mathematical structure he wants, and he can uh, use the mappings and the theoretical objects there to uh, construct uh, their theories about reality, right? But, uh, but yeah, so another question is, how are the assumptions about these two postulates, uh, Helmholtz wave and mirror, a mirroring relations together with the assumption about the logical mathematical properties be robust enough that it can give us uh, some of the information that we want about uh, the, the world? So one thing we need is an explicitly articulated extension of the research program uh, beyond single observers incorporating uh, times in a manner which is more explicit. I mean, there's just, in principle, there doesn't seem to be a problem here, but there's also the Newman problem, which I wanted to uh, make some comments on at some point. Um, uh, going to say a little bit more about this in a few minutes. And, um, but it's basically a, a very important problem for epistemic structural realist views. And there's a sense in which if it, the, the problem can't be solved, then the accusation of triviality can be um, uh, not, not necessarily triviality, but the accusation that, that the only thing that the epistemic structural realist is saying about the world is that they know the, the cardinality of the world, which is too weak in a sense to be an interesting realist philosophy of science. Uh, it might be thought. So uh, we have to say something about that. And then um, obviously I'm not going to take care of this right now, but you need to have some sort of way of explaining how continuity in science is possible. So for example, Laudan in his famous paper already considers the view that maybe structure is all that is preserved and uh, he has a series of arguments against the view. But Botsis has, uh, Ioannis Botsis has already um, discussed some of those problems in some of his work, uh, for example, the, the problem of continuity. Uh, however, there are some disagreements about, for example, his approach to the Newman problem. Um, so there are this work from uh, from Otavio also, and uh, recently work by some Rosalian scholars, just such as Greg Landini and Thomas Pashby. So the, the, the Pashby approach actually I really like, and I am going to mention something about that in a second. Right, so, um, so very quickly on the Pashby approach, uh, part of the issue is that the, the Newman theorem sees, says that if you have some collection C with some cardinality uh, and you have some structure S, you know, some which is a set with relations in it, then uh, you can uh, give a mapping between that structure and, the, and that uh, set such that you can get a new structure where that set is the domain and you have, uh, the, and you can preserve the, the, the same structure, right? So, and uh, that's linked with some discussions in model theory, for example, what some people call the push-through construction uh, and the Putnam paradox and other paradoxes. But the, uh, part of the problem here is that um, it seems, so for example, if, you, if you're just relying on, your, on the structure of your percepts and the, and the uh, logical mathematical properties there, then you could just easily take a mapping from those to the world and say that the world has that structure. And obviously you want, uh, ideally you want to say more than that. So, for example, um, Pashby has proposed the idea that there might be two, re two readings of this. On one reading uh, of Russell's work, Russell is saying that um, uh, we are at least acquainted with some sort of relation of overlap, uh, what, what he calls copunctuality between percepts and non-percepts. And this notion of copunctuality applies uh, to instance of time or points of space. Uh, but the important idea here will be that um, maybe the same relation is, be, is the one that's acquainted on the one side and the other, so that uh, we can get, get a full call of what's going on because, uh, in a sense, this relation bridges both the nominal and phenomenal world, in a sense. Uh, that's one reading, but there's another reading which is weaker than that, which is that even if, we are, if it's not the same relation, it's at least the same relation type. So when we are saying that we should track the relation uh, between percepts, we are saying that uh, specifically, the, the nominal world is going to reflect that relation type. 
so uh, the, 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 like the, the causes of our percepts are going to, to, to reflect that relation type. And in that sense, the claim is more than uh, just a cardinality claim because it's saying that a specific structure is being recovered. And um, uh, I'm going to mention this a little bit at the end, but going back quickly to Russell, uh, he said that physics is mathematical because we know so much, not because we know so much about the physical world, but because we know so little. It's only the mathematical properties that we can discover. And of course, as we all know, Russell held all his life that mathematics is nothing more than logic. So uh, even it, until, the day, until the end, he held to this view. So it's basically logic, right? Then an interesting thing about uh, the Rossellian view is that even as early as 1903 in the principles of mathematics, he was already thinking about the interpretation of physical theories. So some people, for example, a priest will uh, say that uh, Say, say that uh, the, the Rossellian view about motion, for example, is our view which is not explanatory because it's only a view about uh, mathematical properties. But if he had read uh, principles of mathematics a bit more um, carefully, he will have noticed that um, he doesn't say that. He actually provides a metaphysical characteristic. Uh, he actually provides a way of saying what's the ontology of um, the physical world in terms of motion, particles, and persistence, etc. Uh, but the, the view that he held at the time, it was in a sense what we might might call the intuitive view. So for example, if physicists say something like there are point particles and point particles endure through time and so, stuff like that, then uh, when you have a mathematical theory, you have to interpret the theory in terms of something like that view. So the I guess the, the important changes that went through Russell's philosophy uh, as he went, as he matured philosophically was that even those assumptions could be, even those assumptions about the ontology could be discarded. So that um, you didn't really need, for example, space time points, or you didn't really need enduring point particles. You only needed to recover what was important for the, um, for reasoning about the structure. So, uh, so, as I mentioned, there's a discussion in, for example, his response to Newman about the sort of relations that can uh, help us gain a foothold in the nominal realm, which is which are going to have to do with overlap. And uh, he mentions a number of relations that we have some acquaintance with uh, in the world of percepts, so for example, temporal and, spe and spatial contiguity, etc. And we might think that uh, in, in whatever reading of the of the Pashby interpretation that I just gave you, there's going to be a, a mapping which recovers either the logical mathematical properties or the uh, or says that the same relation holds between the phenomenal and nominal world. Um, there's also going to be a proposal about dividing problems in logical, physical, and epistemic. And this is going to be relevant uh, in the sense that the logical problems are just going to have to do with the choice of logic and how to reason about, uh, how to use this logic to reason about the physical world. And the physical problem is going to have to do with how to use that logic or that those logical structures to interpret uh, um, um, what's going on at the level of the physics. And uh, he's going to say, well, we have a lot of freedom about how, how we're going to interpret uh, the logic in terms of the physics, as long as it satisfies certain formal structures that we can reason with. And one thing which is really important to emphasize here is that he is going to be very committed to the idea that um, there's no reason a priori to commit to any specific metaphysics about space-time or any uh, heavy-duty metaphysics uh, uh, involving substantivalism with, with this view. At least substantivalism about space-time, right? Because Russell seems to be, at least at this stage, inclined to some sort of uh, realistic views about the logic. But uh, yeah that I might, if during the q and I might say more about that if there's time. Uh, but also what we were, uh, what I was mentioning about extending the methodology from a solipsistic basis to uh, something encompassing data outside a purely physical body. So here are some connections with it, which I think are interesting. Um, so for example, Nerlich, when discussing uh, Kant and Leibniz, he's discussing, for, for example, Nerlich is interested in the problem of the nature of space, and he's in, uh, a realist about space, but he's uh, 
trying to discuss, he's interested in discussing three rival views. And one of those uh, views is, um, of those two views are views on relationism. So relationism, if you might remember, is the view that uh, space just consists of material objects and the spatial temporal distances between them. That's like the standard relationist view. But Nerlich mentions the Leibniz view and the Kantian view, which are supposed to be pure relationism. And it's in a sense pure relationism because um, according to our reading of Leibniz and Kant, they were trying to do the work of constructing a space without positing uh, sp spatial relations. So for example, in the case of Leibniz, he was just going to posit monads, which are pers perspectives, and some ordering relations between the monads. And uh, assuming that there are sufficient monads and sufficient and uh, there are sufficient uh, overlap and continuity between them, then one might be able to recover the structure of a space from just from the structure of the percepts between the monads. That was at least a strategy. Of course, that doesn't mean it's a successful strategy. And uh, the idea, and Kant's idea obviously was that space was completely subjective and that there was no way of getting behind the space to get to know what was going on uh, at the nominal world. And this is interesting because I think that Russell, in a sense, is in a bit in the middle, uh, in the middle road between Leibniz and Kant, while being a, a, a realist about the external world. So for example, Le Russell is going to take very seriously the idea of using perspectives, as Leibniz did, uh, to, uh, for his, his, constructions of, his construction of space. Uh, but he's not going to, th to think that there are only minds and ordering relations between them. He's going to believe in some form of causality. But um, the idea of perspectives and the difference between private and public spaces is very important for, for Russell. And in the case of Kant, the connection, the, the interesting connection is also uh, that Russell held that um, if you had these assumptions about Helmholtz whale and the mirroring relations principle, you might be able also to get uh, from percepts to the non-perceptual world. Uh, so that Kant was being too radical when he gave up that possibility. That quote is basically about that. So, Right, so so I guess one important thing that I wanted to draw your attention quickly very before uh, moving on to the space-time case uh, very quickly is that the way in which um, these constructions attempt to fill the gaps. So for example, if we think about the early Russell, some of his early constructions involving sense data and sensibilia, uh, one of the problems there is a clear model theoretic problem, which is we need to have enough objects to uh, satisfy some sort of structure. So, for example, people often often say that uh, Russell's early epistemology had two features which it didn't have it that it was a foundationalist epistemology, which it wasn't, and that also it included only sense data, which it didn't. It also includes sensibilia, which was which were um, perspectives from uh, points of view where no one was present. But of course, those, the, the, the important point here is that he was aware that he needed some sort of um, uh, to, uh, to to fill some to, to fill the void of perspectives all over the place, as Leibniz was trying to do in order to be able to recover something like space time. And uh, but some of the problem here was that the I mean th these posits are a bit too radical, and it's not clear what sort of relation of relations hold between them that they can help us recover uh, public space in a satisfactory manner. So, but as I mentioned, a very important model theoretic aspect of this is that you need to have enough objects at least to recover space, and you need to have certain relations between them, for example, certain continuity relations. So that's just the role that sense data and sensibility were playing there. And some of these postulates are supposed to be playing the same role. Uh, in, in human knowledge, but um, uh, obviously they are less radical than the than the posit than the positing of sensibility and sense data. So, for example, he has the postulate of quasi permanence, which is about linking persisting uh, things, uh, which are going to be temporal parts for him, events, uh, through causality, and he's going to have the postulate of separable causal lines, and especially temporal continuity in, in causal lines. And, but the important point about these postulates is that um, he's going to have assumptions about persistence, even though he's not going to believe in perduring particles, in enduring particles. He's going to have, as, to have assumptions about causal lines that you can uh, individuate, even though uh, you might be receiving input from all sorts of places. 
So that's going to allow you to keep doing something like mirroring relations and stuff like that. And uh, similar structures arranged about the center and spatial temporal contiguity have, are going to have to do with overlap. So filling, filling up that, those spaces. And also a very important, the, the very important notion of a structural similarity. There's, there's going to be, and the idea here is that if there's going to be a structural similarity between the, the last point at the end of the chain of causal, of, of causal perception and the point before, then we should suppose that there's such structural similarity at every point. And so an example here will be if you're listening, if you're listening to a piece of music through the radio, even though the, the I mean, the radio obviously is very different from the, from listening to it in a concert, but they are, if this, the similarity between those two things will be explained by the, the structural similarity between the, uh, the, under, the, the underlying physics there. But in a sense, the point of this is that it's going to give you what we need more theoretically to have enough objects and also um, it's going to give us the sort of contiguity relations we want, we, we need to construct space. Uh, but it's not a full-blown ontology, right? Uh, it's just a series of assumptions that are going to be able to help us to recover with the other assumptions, uh, uh, whatever space is. So um, going very quickly through the space-time case, uh, like the standard formulation for space-time is, uh, for example, mod Modlins, which is one of the, I think, the, be the best formulations. Um, and he has, he distinguishes three properties that uh, space, some space terms have, which are the affine property, the metrical property, and the topological property. So for example, the affine property allows us to distinguish, if you have some particles in motion, it allows us to distinguish particles which have, um, which are accelerating from particles which are just having uh, in, in, in inertial motion. Uh, the metrical property is just going to allow us to define distances between uh, points in space and uh, distances in, in time. I'm focusing on the classical space case for just ease of exposition. And the topological property is going to have to involve uh, structure and continuity of um, extra, uh, continuity and order. So the idea is that uh, uh, the physics or the, Newton, the, the, news, the, the Newtonian laws are going to presuppose a, a, a spatial temporal structure that has at, at least these properties that allows us to distinguish these sorts of trajectories that have continuity, order, and distances. Uh, but one important feature about the Newtonian case is that some of the trajectories are, are privileged. So for example, absolute rest, the idea is that there are going to be some trajectories in space that uh, even though they are in, in, undetectable and unobservable, they are always going to be the same sort of trajectories. Uh, privileged with, with regards to everything with regards to those trajectories, everything that is moving with regards to those trajectories is going to be absolutely moving. And everything that stays at that point is going to be absolutely at rest. But there's nothing in the physics that reminds uh, that requires anything of the sort. But we also have um, the Galilean space-time uh, case where uh, you have a little bit less structure. So you don't have, for example, distances between different times. And that's not going to, basically what the result of that is going to be is that um, you are going to lack absolute positions, but you're going to be able to have everything else, like trajectories for ob objects accelerating and objects in, um, uh, absolutely accelerating and objects which are, and you're only, you're only going to have uh, relative motions, but you're not going to have something like absolute velocities. And I, not, I don't know that I'm going to have time to go too much into the weather construction, but so there's, but what I'm going to say just really quickly is that there's another way of doing the same work with, just with vectors, uh, explaining what's going on at the level of, so if, for example, you take some point in space and you can find ways of connecting that point to other points. And it's going to respect some properties of obviously the linear algebra. I'm going to give, and it's going to give you some distances for points in space and for, and for points in time. And it's going to allow you to uh, to see how some of the space-time properties you can so so how can you discuss some of the space-time properties from specific points, individual points, as if you're talking about perspectives. So that connects back to the Leibniz or Rosellian view about the importance of perspectives, and uh, how uh, public space can be uh, like of or global space can be constructed out of those. Obviously, it's equivalent to the modeling formulation, but it's done in a way which highlights these features. And 
so, and this is where I wanted to uh, mention uh, the Mundi model of space-time, right? So the Mundi model of space-time is similar to the Wetherall model. Is It does it also in terms of vectors and connections between vectors. Uh, but un the Wetherall model is a completely classical model in the sense that it, it assumes that there's this structure to the world, like the classical space-time structure. You have these points and you have uh, vectors at each point, uh, which allow you to define space and allow you to define time and distances between space and time. Uh, but in the Mundi model, you are only going to have to be a, you're only going to be able to have occupied points. So whatever points are occupied in space, those are going to be the points that Mo, that Mundi is going to be able to use for his, his construction. And the idea here is going to be that yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, I'm hurrying in purpose on purpose. So, uh, but the important thing about the Mundi model is that. Um, um, he's only going to have occupied points, but in spite of that, he has some interesting proofs. So, for example, he, he can define with the inner product structure, which is just, you know, uh, you multiply scalars, um, they give you a distance uh, between uh, vectors, and uh, you're going to be able to get uh, lengths, and you're going to be able to get uh, angles. Uh, and all of those things, given the, pro the linear algebraic properties of the space, are going to be able to uh, allow you to define uh, a, a space-like slices, time-like slices. Whenever you embed those materially occupied points into an abstract vector space, so the idea is that you begin from a, from a, from a concrete space-time occupied by points, and then you go up in a sense into an abstract structure, and uh, that that embedding is unique up to isomorphism. But it's importantly there's no natural way to interpret what arrows are doing there because you might have unoccupied uh, um, connections between the space-time points. So be, 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 between between the, the the material occupants, you might there might not be not, there might not be anything, because you're not. Uh, I mean, there's no requirement that uh, in the Mundi, Mundi model the Mundi model this condition is satisfied by material objects. But um, an important notion here that uh, we may want to uh, recover is the notion of uh, path length of a metric connected by path length or geodesics, which is a different notion from the just pure metric that you give with a distance function function and allows you, it's a local notion. And it's a notion which is very naturally interpreted in, in classical models where you have space and you assume that uh, you have uh, connectedness between any, any two points in space. And the important point here for the Rossellian view is that given the assumptions that he makes about a uh, causal uh, uh, the separability of causal lines uh, and the and the structural similarity and the contiguity or overlap, <laughs> you are going to have uh, enough structure to recover, uh, I think, path length, and um, and so this way of defining the metric, which is I think more standard than the than the other way, in which uh, I think physicists do it prefer to do it this way than the other way. Elias might tell me that I'm way off about that at any point. So. Uh, but yeah, I mean, part of the idea is that maybe you can use all of those things to recover some of that and, and in a sense, fill up the missing information. Uh, but there are some problems uh, which remain here. So, for example, one problem is, uh, given the assumptions that we have about causality and the structural similarity, not only at the level of the last uh, part of the causal chain, but at every level in between, um, even these, these discussions about, for example, whether the relation at the level of the person is the same one that's still doing the ordering at the level of the nominal world, even given a combination of those views, you might wonder whether that's an epistemic structural realist view or whether that's just partial structural realism. But maybe that's not bad enough. I mean, it's still, it's, it's still not a full-blown ontology in the sense of a commitment to specific physical objects. You're, you're in a sense filling up the structure with some of the uh, some postulates that you need to recover some of the relevant uh, mathematical structures. Uh, but some further problems remain. So, for example, there's the problem of, um, for example, in Galilean spacetime. I'm just about to finish. In Galilean spacetime, um, you are not going to have anything like absolute velocities, or for example, you are not going to have a, a, in the um, 
uh, weather formulation, you're not going to have absolute uh, three, velocity, three velocities, but you're still going to have absolute positions uh, a, a, at the level of space like slices at a time. So for example, if you have a slice of points at, uh, at just at a single time, those points are still going to have distances between them, not between, not between that space-like surface and any other, but within that space-like surface. And that seems to be redundant structure. Uh, and here I might, I'm, I've been thinking that maybe some of Russell's constructions of uh, points, so getting rid of the points via uh, constructions might help to make it more acceptable, but uh, I need to think a little bit more about that. So, yeah. Thanks, this is a very nice and rich paper. Um, I have one question whether you may, with a partial structural uh, realism, you may not end up with the difficulties on both sides, by difficulties of just standard uh, structural, epistemic structural realism, but also uh, standard scientific realism, right? given that it's not just purely structural. Right. right? So, and you may end up rather with the, the best of both worlds, so you get the worst of both. Could you elaborate a little bit more on, on the objection? No, yeah. the, the, the thought is um, to the extent that the uh, ontology uh, of the partial uh, the ESR mm -hmm. uh, is not just purely structural, right? right? Then a story needs to be told about what kind of commitments you have to these positives, how can you secure reference to them, what kind of methodological status they have, uh, which are the usual concerns that raise people away, move, get got people away from uh, scientific realism, right, and move into some form of structuralism. Right. right. Because, uh, so th that's the concern you may have there. Then you get the the structural realists looking at uh, um, uh, at you and say, "Look, we cannot get the benefits of being a, a structuralist field uh, because we have these extra commitments as well." Right? And then you go back to problems about continuity, uh, fluid theory, change. What? Uh, how can we ensure that those things do not get lost? Right? Uh, the, the extra. Uh, right, right. Technology. So that, that's the concern, right? And then, because um, for you then to argue that there, you can ensure you have the benefits that ESR has, you need to make sure that the ontology will not be the kind of thing that, uh, that in theory change, you need to tell a story about continuity. Right, yeah, no, um, I, can, I see your point. I guess what I'm thinking is that, so I might, I guess I, I will say two things. So, for example, there's uh, obviously, so for example, on the two readings I gave of, the, of what's going on with the Newman problem, uh, which I, in, in, specifically in this case, I took uh, from Pashby instead of uh, Ioannis, uh, on those two readings, on the reading which gives you partial um, structural realism, then you might say, well, look, uh, we still don't have a full-fledged ontology. We have some assumptions about what's going on at the level of um, um, the relations between uh, events uh, involving simi structural similarity and uh, what Russell calls separability of causal lines. So the, the, the causality assumption might be a worry, like what exactly exactly is causality. But in a sense, it's a much, so my impression is that it's a much weaker assumption that you will get, for example, in the standard scientific realist case, where you make very full-blooded assumptions about what the relations are, what the ontology is, etc. That's that's one thought. But so another thought is that of course you don't want to marry something like, um, and I never wanted to propose that you don't want to marry specifically something like Russell's HK postulates, just as you don't want to marry necessarily classical logic, um, as Russell did. So you might, I mean, you might do that. But the point is that the, the methodology is more general than that. So the, and the methodology is just. Uh, try to look for some uh, assumptions and some postulates that are going to allow you to recover what you want in order to uh, model some phenomena and still keep some form of realism. 
Uh, so you might be able to weaken the post, the HK, something like the HK postulates, or you might be able to weaken uh, some of the uh, uh, structure, some of the assumptions involving the just the mathematical parts of the structures. Uh, I don't know that that might help. It might not help, but uh, and I guess the, the other response will be to think, but I haven't really thought about this uh, thoroughly, but. Uh, where you don't have the same relation on the nominal side and the phenomenal side, but you only have the logical mathematical properties. And then uh, what Russell calls causal, uh, the causal separability and, and, and contiguity is just some sort of logical mathematical property, which these objects in the unobservable domain might have. Uh, but I, I will need to think more about that definitely. Yeah. Just, yeah, go ahead. One, no, I, I see why you know, you want to push this as a sort of semi-structural uh, uh, ontology. Uh, the, the worry is, uh, one of the reasons, for example, in Leibniz, uh, he pushed away from scientific realism, uh, was thinking about the status of quantum particles, right, and how clear it is, it's not even through a kind of object, it's you know, the individuals or not, the considerations of that sort. And so if it's not part of your ontology, things that might invite unclarity about those things at the level of quasi-structure or something like that, that might be just as problematic. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, you. You might be completely right about that. I guess I just don't see it yet. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking that, um, I don't know, the, the impression I get is that it's sufficiently weak that it should, uh, under determine a series of, of possible models to interpret what's going on, at, for example, at the level of uh, causal separability or stuff like that, that is, it shouldn't be too much of a, of, of a concern, but, um, yeah, maybe maybe I need to uh, maybe we can talk more about this afterwards. Right. Yeah. So thank you for the talk. I enjoyed that. Um, I wasn't quite sure. So it's kind of related to what Otavio was asking. I wasn't quite sure about the commitments of this partial ESR view R. So uh, you were just referring to it more loosely. You meant um, so. From what I gathered from the discussion we had with Otavio is mm -hmm. that. It's somehow stronger than epistemic structural realism, so it, 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 you know, it's kind of inching towards scientific realism, but it's not really as strong. Uh, so, what what exact commitments would this? Right. So, what I'm thinking is that, um, so for example, take just take a step back and think, for example, of some view like Lewis's view about uh, Ramsayan humility or something like that, and you have some sort of uh, naturalness property or you might have something like universals uh, uh, or natural properties which are uh, guiding theory choice. So what I'm thinking is that, uh, for example, the, the, the causal lines here, the, which are separable, uh, something like that relation might be, I guess, a sort of a distinguished relation, uh, but that you don't need a specific ontology to, uh, that, uh, that's underlying that relation. Uh, for example, and also the notion of contiguity or overlap, it might be a, so I don't know how, I don't know if, so for example, for that case, I don't know how uh, non-structural you might need to go. I mean, you could just take it at face value and assume that it's a notion that can be defined, for example, as some sort of non-empty intersection or in, the, or in a meteorological way, which is uh, completely consistent with a purely logical definition. But yeah, what, what I'm thinking is just that, that this notion of a structural similarity or, or, or separability of causal lines, uh, you might, so in, in one of the readings, you might need to posit there's some sort of distinguished structure, which, um, yeah. But as, I, as I'm saying, this might also be compatible with a weaker reading. Uh, but that part I haven't, I don't have it worked out yet. Right, 
what difference do you make between this kind of view and the idea that there would be uh, regularities uh, in our observations? So that you really have to interpret the structure somehow in a realistic way? Is it the causal aspect that does this job or something else? Or? Um, so, for example, um, in, in the in, in the discussion I just mentioned, which has, was like a very sparse mention of Russell's uh, response to Newman. So the response is very, like very, he, he just says, um, you're completely right about uh, this problem. I hadn't noticed this problem, but of course I didn't mean to say what I did say. So uh, I've been thinking that there might be contiguity between percepts and non-percepts. That's, that's just quoting Russell, right? And uh, in, for example, in the analysis of matter, he mentions a number of relations that we might be acquainted with in perception, for example, temporal contiguity, spatial, con uh, spatial contiguity, etc. But so, for example, one of the key notions, if, if you look at, for example, some of the construction of, of the constructions of space and time that he performs in that book, one of the key notions, there is the notion of overlap, uh, which is just what he's thinking when he's thinking about continuity. Con uh, contiguity. So, and this so and, and, and something interesting about this relation of overlap is that, uh, for example, here I mentioned just the reconstruction of uh, classical space-time, how, how you might see different models in light of that, but you might use something like the notion of overlap even in cases which are more complicated, like Minkowski space-time. Um, <coughs> but but yeah, the point is that that on the two readings I was mentioning. Um, on one reading, the, the, the notion of contiguity, for example, the sorts of, of relations of contiguity that you observe perceptually, uh, would also be part of what's going on at the in the at the unobservable level. So yeah. the mapping would not be would not just be a map, um, pure cardinality mapping. And on the weaker reading, which Pashby proposes, uh, you might say that uh, what's important is that the same relation type is on the side of the observable and the, on the unobservable world. So for example, if you have some sort of partial order, for example, if you have some partial order between events at the observable world, then because the partial order defines a very specific big bijection uh, and not just any old bijection, when you're thinking about the unobservable world, then that partial order will correspond to structure there. Yeah, about the continuity aspect, uh, I'm not sure if it's not just between all of the structure yeah, no, it, it's definitely about, putting more structure. And about interpreting uh, something that you observe uh, as a uh, fine to the observable world. Uh, yeah, I think some, uh, like for example, uh, about Preston extends uh, is an interesting that he, he says that uh, uh, theory not proof of the observable phenomena, even if it's not actually observed. So there is, there is always. Uh, this kind of extension to what it's not, what is not actually observed. And I wonder if it makes a difference to say, yeah, but it also applies to, yeah. And, yeah, I, I didn't really uh, follow that part, but I guess what, what so for example, historically, for, even for example, in the original Demopoulos Friedman paper uh, from 1980, uh, when they are discussing Carnap, for example, and they're talking about the relation of foundedness, or when, for example, Lewis is doing the work with the, the property of relation of naturalness, like these sorts of families of solution to the Newman problem usually involve a, a bit of additional structure, uh, but not full blown uh, scientific realism, for example. I think that Ioannis' solution doesn't uh, uh, presuppose any further structure, but uh, yeah, uh, I, I, the case I, in the case I was mentioning, yeah. Well, one more minute, so quickly, But uh, I remember from Kant that the human world is not accessible to humans. So, right. Uh, we cannot talk about cultural anything in the normal world if we don't have access to that. Yeah, yeah. So does this mean that realists are committed only to the phenomenological world? And in such, shouldn't they be worried about the phenomenological world as well? Uh, I didn't get that last part. Yes, because uh, I understand realism as they, they don't make this distinction because they believe they have access to everything. But if you introduce the nominal world that you don't have access to, 
then you can't say anything to the things you have no access to. So this is the ontology of the realist should stop only at the phenomenological world. Right. Yeah. No, I guess I mentioned Kant only for the purposes of historical illustration, because I think that there are some philosophical connections there which are interesting. But so, for example, the point where I mentioned that uh, there were some some affinities between the Rossellian view and the uh, Leibniz and Kant. And what I mentioned specifically, and for example, Russell in the introduction to mathematical philosophy is very clear about this, that he says that uh, there that it's very reasonable. So and here's the, the where the issue about foundationalism is very important because Russell was not a foundationalist. So he assumes that science is broadly right. And he says, well, one assumption here that is a key assumption will be to suppose that there's some sort of um, um, of, of, of mirroring relation between what's going on at the level of percepts and what's going on at the level of uh, non-percepts. And that's the key assumption because even if you assume that there's something at the level of the observables that you cannot uh, never have any acquaintance with. If you have this further assumption about mirroring relations together with the assumption, the, with the logical mathematical assumptions, then you are able to bridge that gap for the structural realist at least. But I mean, someone who gives up uh, that distinction, I mean, definitely, I think that they should maybe have be idealist or phenomenalist, I guess. Yeah. All right. So let's thank him. Um, Do we have a break? We have a five minutes break, so you understand the uh, slides, and then we come back. Please do not take longer than five minutes. Uh, Maria, how do? Come on. Oh. Oh.